I think it's going to be an incredible game. Incredible game. I'm leaning just ever so slightly in favor of Kansas State to pull off the upset. I feel like they actually can do it. Now, will it make a difference? It's going to be interesting to find out. Well, welcome to Always College Football. Today is Friday, December 2nd. We hope that you're enjoying the show right as you're getting the show. Whether that's here with us on the ESPN YouTube channel or if you're here with us via the podcast, please like, rate, and subscribe. Hit us up on social media. Tell your friends. It helps us out. It helps the show out. I'm Greg McElroy. Along with me, as always, is Jack Kubiak. We're all rolling along here as we get you ready for these conference championship games. Look, big game plan today. It's the same thing we do every Friday. We're going to preview the games, preview the matchups. Some places are going to only talk about playoff hypotheticals. Not here. Every single one of these games matters. All their outcomes matter. Some of them are tonight. Some of them are tomorrow. But we're going to have you prepared. and You're going to be as informed as anybody when it comes to the conference championship slate. So let's not waste any time. Let's take a peek at some of these games, and then maybe a little bit further down the road, we'll start to talk a little bit about what might be going down as far as the 12-team playoff expansion is concerned, because there's a little bit of news and notes coming out of the Rose Bowl from that as well. So let's not waste any time. Let's get into these games. Let's get into these matchups. Let's talk about it. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. All right, we already gave you our USC and Utah preview, the Pac-12 championship game. So if you missed that, go back and check out some of the breakdowns that we've done in the last couple of days. You'll see it. It's in there. You might have swung past it, but you can swing on back and check it out. I think it's going to be a great one tonight when they tee it up in Las Vegas. But let's move ahead now to the games that will be played tomorrow. Let's start in chronological order. <laughs> let's start in AT&T Stadium there in Jerry World, all right? I'm very excited for this matchup. As you guys know that have listened to the show, these have been two teams that we've been on and been hot about all off season and all season. These are actually two of the teams that we had picked in the Big 12 Championship game. So finally, we got something right. That one in the ACC title game, but how hard was that? That was Clemson and pick a winner in the Coastal. We took Carolina. It worked out for us. So <laughs> not, not so great on some of the others, I might add. We did have Utah in the Pac-12 championship. We did, have, uh, we did not have Michigan in the Big Ten championship. We certainly didn't have Purdue in the Big Ten championship. We didn't have LSU in the SEC championship. We did have UCF in the American Championship. We definitely didn't have Tulane, so we we didn't do great as far as our preseason prognostications are concerned across the board. But we did have TCU and Kansas State in the Big 12 Championship game. Uh, I am a little bit surprised, though. I'm a little surprised with how these teams have gotten to this point. I didn't think TCU would be this far ahead of schedule on the defensive side. I thought offensively they'd be great. And don't get me wrong, we're not going to sit here and evaluate TCU as a defensive juggernaut, right? This is not the 85 Bears. But they've been pretty good, man, on both sides of the ball, and I don't think their defense is getting enough credit. They're very good on the perimeter. Both corners have been excellent. They've been really good in the back end as well. So this will be a challenge I think for Kansas State and the newly appointed starting quarterback, Will Howard, he's going to have to continue to take shots down the field. That's part of the reason why he's been the starting quarterback, and I think that's part of the reason why they have a real chance of pulling off the upset against the Horn Frogs. Let's look a little bit about where TCU stacks up as far as the Big 12 is concerned. They're one of only seven teams that have started 12-0 and in the Big 12 championship game. All right, among the group, 2005 Texas, 2000 Oklahoma, and 97 Nebraska all went on to win the national championship. So TCU in rare air as one of only seven teams that started their season 12-0 and to play in the Big 12 championship. 09 Texas, they played for the championship, didn't win it. 2005 Texas played for and won 
the national championship. You have 2003 and 2004 Oklahoma, of course, both those teams coming up short in the national championship game, once to LSU, one to USC. And then we reference both 2000 Oklahoma, who won the national championship, and 1997 Nebraska, who split it with Michigan. So 12-0 and has been very good as far as getting to the national championship game. Four Big 12 teams in the past. Can TCU do it for the first time in 13 years? We shall find out. Look, rematches are very interesting. I love the round-robin format that the Big 12 has provided us. They play everybody, and then you take your top two teams, and you see who's best on the championship Saturday. Other conferences are doing away with divisions, so they're going to have a similar format. Take the top two teams, and let's see what happens. Pac-12's done it this year as well. I think it's a good move for all teams as we move forward to strengthen the matchups that you might get in the conference championship. When you also look at it too, look at the rematches that have gone down in the Big 12 title game. This is the 11th time the Big 12 title game has featured a regular season rematch. Of the 10 previous instances, six of the teams won for the second time and four were split. So basically, there's been 10 times as the 11th, six times the team that won the regular season went on, Four times the team that lost in the regular season went on and pulled it out. TCU and Kansas State, of course, played in week eight. TCU won the game 38-28. They were down 28-10 in the ball game. That was in the second quarter before they scored 28 unanswered points to win the game. That 18-point comeback, still the most that they've come back from all season long. And in the regular season matchup, too, you look at Kansas State, man, their defense just completely went to sleep, or their offense, excuse me, completely went to sleep in the second half. They were rolling early on. They were averaging over 10 yards per play in the first half of that football game. And in the second half, TCU's defense, like I said, a very underappreciated part of their game, that defense really clamped down, allowing just 3.4 yards per play in the second half of the football game, 87 total yards in the second half of that football game as well. Look, TCU has been a team that's been very comfortable playing in close games. They'd won seven straight games prior to last week. Of course, it was a blowout against Iowa State, but they had played seven consecutive games in which they were decided by 10 points or less. So close games have been very beneficial to the Horn Frogs up to this point. They also have been terrific when it comes to creating big plays. That's who they are. They're an offense that thrives pushing the ball down the field, an offense that thrives on getting space for Kendry Miller and allowing him to make sure he can operate not in a phone booth. That's not where he's going to be at his best. But when you get him outside and you get him into some open spaces, you spread the field, he's in a really good position. They have 17 plays of 50 or more yards this season. That's second only to Tennessee in all of college football. But we all know in this team, straw that stirs the drink is Max Duggan. There's three things he does exceptionally well. One, downfield passing. He completes nearly 55% on passes that travel more than 20 yards. That's huge. Two, he's terrific against pressure. The more you try to heat him up, the better he is at taking advantage of your aggressiveness. He averages 10.1 yards per attempt when he's facing the blitz and when he's facing pressure. He's also got six touchdowns against zero interceptions in such circumstances as well. And then finally, I already referenced Kendry Miller. He's awesome. Just a terrific, terrific back, especially when hitting it downhill. Very vertical runner who wants to get downhill. But off play action, that's when Max Duggan's really at his best. He averages 11.3 yards per attempt off of play action. That's the fifth best in college football. He's also got 12 to 1 touchdown interception ratio there as well. So I think he's been terrific. He, of course, if he plays well, they don't just win, but they win convincingly. And then on the other side, you look at what they've become now, Kansas State, with Howard under center. They're now 3-0 and in the games that he's started. They're averaging 48 points a game in the games he's started. And they're averaging about 460 yards of offense in the games that he's started. Plus the passing attack. Look, Adrian Martinez, for as athletic as he is, the balance that Howard has provided in order to complement Deuce Vaughn. And Deuce Vaughn is the guy now. No denying who the man is when it comes to Kansas State's offense. If you can bottle up Deuce Vaughn, you have a real chance, but that's going to be incredibly difficult. Howard has done a really good job of complementing Deuce Vaughn's presence there in the backfield with some downfield passes. He's been very, very good when pushing the ball downfield. That's why he's the starting quarterback. And against TCU, you might have to create some chunk plays of your own, but it won't be easy. Deuce Vaughn gets it on the perimeter. He gets it up inside. He can do it all. He's one of the most electric, versatile 
offensive weapons in all of college football should be a bona fide first team all American as the all purpose back. I think it's going to be an incredible game, incredible game. I'm leaning just ever so slightly in favor of Kansas state to pull off the upset. I feel like they actually can do it now. Will it make a difference? It's going to be interesting to find out. I think TCU is playing extremely good football right now, but I think Kansas state is a little bit more physical along the line of scrimmage. Their defensive line is phenomenal. And I thought they had every opportunity to win the game last time and just couldn't get anything to go for them there in the second half. I think this time now with TCU being told all week, yeah, it doesn't matter. You're in anyways. I think Kansas State pulls off a shocker there at noon Eastern time on ABC. All right, let's move next to LSU and Georgia, the SEC championship game. I'll just start by saying I don't think this game is going to be super close. I think Georgia is considerably better. I think LSU has been a terrific story and has been awesome to watch all season long. They're so well coached. They've done a great job both offensively and defensively that have found them in this position. But Georgia, even though they haven't been as elite offensively the last couple of weeks, I'm still really optimistic with what I've seen from that team. When they've had to have it, they've had it. And I think they'll have it again on Saturday afternoon. Let's start with LSU. How do they pull the upset? They need Jaden Daniels to go off. He has to have, by far, the best game of his career. It's important. It's absolutely imperative. But the one thing that I think Georgia will do is they'll take their outstanding linebacker core and they will keep eyes in the backfield at all times because if Jaden Daniels gets loose that's on you you know what LSU's best offensive weapon is and it's Jaden Daniels by a mile so far he leads LSU with 824 rushing yards this year is topped 100 yards three times Georgia hasn't allowed a player to rush for more than 90 yards in a game this year Really, if you go back to last year, that's over the course of the last two years. And the last quarterback to rush for 100 yards against the Bulldogs was Josh Dobbs. That was seven years ago, back in 2015. He, of course, was the quarterback for the Tennessee Volunteers. I remember that game vividly. I don't think Georgia is going to allow Jaden Daniels to get loose. This is a very well-coached defense at all three levels. It is a really sound defense when it comes to keeping their eyes and not committing eye violations. And... Regardless of what LSU tries to do in order to complement Jaden Daniels' run game, the linebackers at the second level now for Georgia, they're erasers, man. They can make you wrong. Now, are they as good as N'Kobe Dean? I don't know if I'm going to go that far. I think they're excellent. I love watching them. But I don't know if they're quite as good as the year before, but I don't know if it's really going to matter as much in the matchup right here. Now, LSU's got a pretty good physically imposing offensive line. I'm not sure the pass rush is going to be there. But I do think there's going to be something that Georgia can try to do to make life a little bit difficult. And I think LSU can counter that somewhat as well. Georgia's very athletic at all three levels. And I think that this is a group, this is probably going to just allow them to two gap and kind of just hold the point because LSU is a big, physically imposing offensive line. Across the board, they go 325, 330, 310, 345, and 350. Okay, right around there, across the board, these are really big offensive linemen. So LSU's game plan is likely to be to grind this thing out, have long, timely drives. The problem is for LSU, they really struggle when they don't utilize tempo. Well, struggle is a relative sense. They're much better when they utilize a little bit of tempo. It minimizes the thinking. It allows them to play fast. It allows them to play instinctively. And the coaching staff will tell you, Jaden Daniels operates better when there's a little bit of urgency within the play caller's rhythm. However, I don't think that's the right approach to use against the Georgia Bulldogs because if you start to utilize a little bit of tempo and you get off schedule, you're in big, big trouble. I think the main thing for LSU, they're going to have to create big plays. If they can't create big plays offensively, they're going to have some issues. So the guys that you lean on for those big plays to be created – you need Malik Neighbors to go off in a one-on-one -on -one situation. I think Keely Ringo is likely going to draw that assignment. You need Kayshawn Booty to go off in a one-on-one -on -one situation. He might operate probably a little bit more out of the slot in this game. That's where I would play him. I think he could potentially find some space, but I don't know if he's going to find enough to make a huge difference in the game. And then number three 
for LSU, Jare Jenkins, he's got to have a big game as well because you know LSU is really going to be trying to force feed the top two. But if number three can step up and make some big plays for him, that could do a lot in opening up the offense. As far as Georgia is concerned, I think they'll be able to run the football. Harold Perkins has been great. Stetson Bennett makes a living off schedule. Stetson Bennett has done a great job getting outside the pocket. 55% of his passing attempts come from outside the pocket. That's the second most in the SEC behind Jaden Daniels. I expect Harold Perkins to be responsible for the entire game for Stetson Bennett. So if Stetson Bennett moves off his spot, if he moves outside the pocket, if he tries to create in a quarterback scramble situation, number 40 for LSU will likely be in charge of keeping Stetson Bennett contained. He can do that by himself. He's done so time and time again this year. Expect that to be his role. Now, where do the other players factor in? And how do you figure out ways to get Brock Bowers in one-on-one situations against LSU safeties? LSU is really good in the secondary. I think they're very, very strong. They, however, were a little bit banged up last week. Will they be closer to 100% this week? We're going to find out. But whoever draws the assignment of Brock Bowers, good luck. If I were Todd Munkin, I'd be moving him all the way around. I'd start him in the backfield. I'd motion him out because LSU wants to play a lot of man. And if they do, you should be able to create favorable matchups for your best offensive weapon. And, of course, you're going to have to make sure you're very aware of where Lad McConkey is at all times. Stetson Bennett, especially off play action, those safeties for LSU do occasionally get a little nosy. Lad McConkey's going to have some one-on-ones on the outside against Makai Garner. That'd be the matchup I'd want if I were them. He's a big physical big physical presence at corner, but I do think you can get behind him. So if I can get Lad McConkey in one-on-ones against Makai Garner, should be an all-points bulletin strike up the fights on for the Georgia Bulldogs. But I think it's going to be a tremendous, tremendous game. I just think Georgia has too much. Georgia, I expect to win this game probably in the vicinity of of two, maybe three touchdowns. I think they probably cover the number at 17, 17 and a half, but it should be an awesome game nonetheless. All right, turning our attention to the Big Ten Championship where everybody had this matchup. I mean, why wouldn't you? You clearly don't know ball if you don't have Purdue playing against the likes of the Michigan Wolverines. I mean, who didn't see this coming? From where Purdue was last year, the pieces they lost, to all the pieces they had to replace, they did bring back their quarterback, and they did bring back Jeff Brom, and we had him on the show earlier this year. thought they'd be good, but goodness gracious, winners of the Big Ten West. I didn't see it coming. Tip of the cap to the Boilermaker faithful out there. They kept the faith, if you will. I mean, goodness gracious, man. What a great, great situation they find themselves in. It was there, what, week one? And they're playing against Penn State, and they gave up that long touchdown at the half. It's like, oh, gosh, Purdue's got some issues on defense. Well, they've figured it out from this point forward. It's been an up-and-down season for Purdue. It really has, but hey, such is life as a Big Ten West team. I feel like every single team in the Big Ten West has had great moments and awful moments all at the same time. But nonetheless, here they are. They were the last man standing, so credit to them for getting the job done. Michigan, meanwhile, can't say we're that surprised by what's gone down from Michigan. The second we watched them against Penn State, we had them at number one in the country. It's like that team right there can flat out go. And sure enough, here we are. Fast forward to the end of the season. They are who we thought they were. What a performance last weekend. They're coming off of maybe the best performance uh, you can make a case that they've had as a team or as a unit in 20 plus years. I mean, to dominate Ohio State by 22-point margin, the widest margin in the game since 1976, to win in the horseshoe for the first time since 2000. It's pretty dang impressive. You know what the problem is? We're still talking about last week. They need to start focusing on this week. And if they don't, this game could be a little bit more uncomfortable than Michigan fans might like to think. Let's talk about Michigan's offense, okay? Let's talk a little bit about where they're at. If you look at where they were against Big Ten opponents all season long, entering the Ohio State game, they were averaging 187 yards a game through the year. They were rushing the ball 250 yards a game, okay? So they didn't have great balance in the Big Ten games leading up to the Ohio State game, all right? But against Ohio State, that balance was flawless. 278 through the year, of course, a couple big plays contributed to that, and then 252 
rushing against Ohio State. Just really impressive to watch how they performed and what they did on the ground in knocking off the Buckeyes. Now, can this be a situation where they can continue to be as aggressive through the air? I think they might have to be. I think this game has a chance to be shockingly high scoring, relatively speaking. But if you look at what the Purdue Boilermakers have been, or as some people have affectionately named them, the Spoilermakers, Aiden O'Connell's 4-1. and one. In starts against AP ranked opponents. He's got 12 touchdowns against just three interceptions. And this season specifically, he's tied with Sean Clifford for the second most passing touchdowns in the Big Ten. Uh, only CJ Stroud has more. They have 22. CJ Stroud has 37. And he leads the conference in passing yardage per game at 284 yards per game. Now, Michigan's defense, they're really tough to throw the football against, okay? They're 11th in the FBS when it comes to passing yardage. That's 177 given up a game, and they've only allowed nine passing touchdowns all season. They actually have picked off more passes than they've allowed go-to receivers in the end zone. So this has been a really good group against the pass. I think the problem with Purdue in this game is that they're one-dimensional. If Purdue was capable, just capable enough of creating a little bit of balance offensively, they might be able to create some issues for Michigan defensively. But if you don't have to respect the run, why would you be feel as though you need to add an extra defender to the box? I don't think you have to. I think Michigan is going to pay conservatively. They're going to keep the ball in front of them, and they're going to trust that their defensive front seven is going to be able to shed Purdue offensive linemen because it's not a great group. They're okay. They're not great by any stretch of the imagination. They'll be able to shed Purdue offensive linemen that are trying to engage in double teams across the front. I don't think Purdue can run the football. If they can, it'd be a totally different animal, but I'm not convinced. I think Penn State, or excuse me, Penn State, I think Michigan can shut down Purdue's rushing attack without having to attribute additional numbers to the run box. Another thing too for Purdue. Now, Purdue's not a bad team against the run defense. Not bad, not great, but they're not bad either. They've had several moments this year in which they've done a pretty good job against opponents on the ground. I think this will be by far their biggest test. If you know and you've listened to me for the last several weeks, I've said it's not close. Michigan has the best offensive line in college football. It's not close. It's by a fairly wide margin. To think that they won the Joe Moore Award last year and they're better this year is a mind-boggling situation. I think they are, though, and I think that's exactly where they're at. I don't know if Purdue's front... It's going to be able to hold up enough over the course of a four-quarter game to be able to keep this run game in check. Now, a couple things I'm going to be watching very closely in this game. One, how is Blake Corum? Is he back? Is he healthy? Is he going to be healthy? All those things are up for legitimate debate. The other things I'm going to be paying very close attention to, and look, I'm not going to sit here and say that This is a juggernaut offense by any stretch of the imagination, but they are an offense that I would hate to play against. I think this Michigan team does a really good job. We all know who the headliners are, right? We all know just how much Blake Corum means to this group, but clearly last week, if there's one thing we've learned, is that the sum is greater than each individual part. Donovan Edwards stepped in and performed beautifully last week. If he needs to be the bell cow back, I no longer have concerns about him being the every down guy. I think CJ Strokes, if he want to put him in there, he could probably be just fine as well. If Stokes wants to be the guy, I think they're going to be just fine. It's not the end of the world. Now, Stokes is obviously a pretty significant drop down from what you're going to get from Corum and Edwards. But if he needs to get in there, especially in a game like this, I'm not going to lose a ton of sleep over it. I think this could also be a game, too, in which you involve some of the receivers in some short passing to get that passing attack into a pretty nice rhythm. Last week, they got going with a hitch route against pressure. Johnson, of course, made a guy miss. He's down the left sideline. Then you feed Johnson on what was a nicely designed play-action pass where he gets one-on-one with the safety. I'd like to see a little bit more underneath. I'd like to see a little bit more intermediate passing in this game. This is going to be a game that Michigan's going to have to screw up. 
They're going to have to turn the ball over. They're going to have to be sloppy. They're going to have to be reading their press clippings for this game to be a four-quarter football game. If they come out and play to their potential, they'll win the game convincingly. Probably a little bit like last year. But either way, I think this game's going to be pretty high scoring. I wouldn't be surprised if Purdue gets their points, but I'd also be real surprised if Purdue can bottle up Michigan for four quarters. I think Michigan wins the game somewhere in the vicinity of like a 38-17 type of performance. So pretty good performance from Purdue, 17 points. It's pretty good against the Michigan defense, especially when you're one-dimensional. But I just don't think they'll be able to keep Michigan in check. I think Michigan gets the job done. All right, then last but not least, but maybe last and potentially least uh, in this particular case, the ACC championship game. This is kind of a disappointing game, if I'm going to be completely honest. A couple weeks ago, you had a one-loss Clemson team that was going to potentially be taking on a one-loss North Carolina team. Maybe North Carolina could have provided the spark to Clemson to kind of boost them up into the playoff discussion. But Clemson, of course, suffered their second loss of the season last week at home, ending what was the longest home win streak in the country. And conversely, losing at the same time to their rival for the first time in God knows how long. All right. Then on the other side, you've seen now a North Carolina team that is on the heels of not one, but two consecutive losses. One against Georgia Tech, and then, of course, two against their in-state rival, who is at way less than 100% going into that game, but still found a way in NC State to get the job done. The big reason why you thought this game had a chance to be exceptionally entertaining was Drake May. Drake May, he's really exceeded expectations all season long. He's been among the top in the FBS as far as all the quarterback categories. Broke the single season passing mark at North Carolina. Did an amazing job. Became you know one of the best as far as touchdown passes to interceptions, he has 35 touchdown passes, the second most in UNC history behind Sam Howell's 38 back in 2019. He's got a ton of big plays under his belt as well. He's got 58 20-plus yard completions, and his total QBR of 84 ranks in the top 10 as well. But if you look at where he was going into the last couple of weeks, man, those numbers were on a whole nother level. Total offense, he's one of the best best in the business this year. Only Austin Reed at Western Kentucky and Michael Penix are within striking distance. Drake May with a total of 4,476 yards of total offense. But really, like I said, it's kind of been a tale of two seasons. However, the season kind of ended, the first season ended after the first 10 games where he was 88 total QBR, 70% completion, nine and a half yards in attempt. 11 to 1 touchdown to interception ratio and an interception rate of under 1%. Well, if you look at the last two games for Drake May, 53 total QBR, completion percentage down 13 points, down from 70 to 57. Yards per attempt down from 9.5 to 5.5. Touchdown to interception ratio went from 11 to 1 to even. Even. Okay, not good when it comes to their touchdown interception ratio and his interception rate went from 0.8% to now 2.5% of his attempts result in the interception. But a big reason why is the dip now that Josh Downs, his best receiver, has explained as well. I mean, the last couple games, just nine catches for 82 yards, but in the previous four, he had 46 catches for 548 yards and six touchdowns. So if you look at What's happened with Josh Downs after coming back from the injury? He hasn't quite been the same guy the last couple of weeks as well. The thing, though, about Clemson, it's really going to go as their quarterback goes. DJ Uwe Ungale had a really poor outing last week against South Carolina. Just 28% completion, the second worst in a game by an FBS quarterback this season. All right, The only other QB with a worse single game completion percentage was Georgia State's Darren Granger, which is against South Carolina back in week one. So it's been a while since we've seen the guy perform so poorly as far as completion percentage is concerned. But the thing is, it's not all about DJ Uwe Ungalale. That's why Dabo Sweeney continues to stand by him. People are saying, why not Cade Klubnik? Why not Cade Klubnik? Well, if you watch at the some of the, some of the separation or lack thereof that some of the receivers have had the last couple of weeks, that's an issue. 
All right, that is a major issue. The receivers have definitely been disappointing and they haven't been super reliable, but DJ Uyungle has missed throws. And that's just not going to fly because this game could be potentially a little bit high scoring. And if it comes down to quarterback play, we all know that Drake may right now, even though he's struggled the last couple of weeks, he's been the better option all season to DJ Uyungle. DJ's legs can potentially be a factor in this game as well, though. If you look at North Carolina all season long, the defense has had their fair share of struggles. They have not been great against the run, which is bad news if you're a North Carolina fan when you're having to go against and defend Will Shipley. He's piled up really the last couple weeks, even last week in the loss, 132 yards on 15 carries. He's the first Tiger player with eight and a half yards per carry in a game since Travis Etienne back in 2020. So if you look at Shipley, if it becomes a game in which it's all about ball control and it's all about trying to create issues along the line of scrimmage for North Carolina's defense, which has struggled, I think they have a real chance of being able to exploit a defense that at times has been very, very up and down. You got to think Gene Chizik, the defensive coordinator for North Carolina, he's going to say, man, I don't care what it takes. We are going to do whatever it is we have to do to stop the run. The uh, guy that can beat us and the guy that will beat us on the opposing team is Will Shipley. He, we cannot let him get loose. That's got to be the game plan for North Carolina. And if you're sitting there and you're looking at it from an offensive coordinator standpoint at Clemson, you better figure out ways to get him in space. I don't care if it's easy completions behind the line of scrimmage. I don't care if it's handoffs or they're getting three, four yards a pop in the first and second quarter. You got to stick to it. You got to stay patient. And you must, absolutely must make sure that Will Shipley gets 25 or 30 touches in the ball game. Anything less than that, I think would be a big disappointment for Clemson's offense. I think Clemson has too much. And I think where they excel, running the football, controlling the line of scrimmage, and affecting the opposing quarterback, those things are going to be on display in this game. I think they win the game by about 10 points. So I think Clemson can get the job done and bring home yet another ACC championship title. Do you have ambitious hiring goals for the last quarter of 2022? With a powerful hiring partner, big goals are no big deal. You need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. Indeed makes hiring all in one place so easy because it takes 10 minutes or less for most small business employers to post a job, according to Indeed Data US. Indeed also has a jaw-dropping pool of talent. In fact, three out of four US online job seekers search for jobs on Indeed each month, according to Comstore. Join over 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to sponsor your job post at Indeed.com slash always. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 offer. All right, still several other games that we want to get to here in just a little bit. So I'm going to give you some nuggets on some of those games. Maybe a betting thing that I slide in there just... You know, a little something for you. Look, if you're watching UTSA in North Texas and you're squeezing that on a Friday night, it's probably because you have a little action on it. So I'll tell you what side. Maybe you need to consider if you don't have a dog in the fight. Maybe I can give you a dog. All right, we'll see. All right, let's start a little bit, though, before we get to that with the news that went down about the inevitable expansion that is going to take place in both 24 and 25. The Rose Bowl has finally... Finally, thank you, Rose Bowl. As if we didn't just need to strong arm them. I don't know why we continue to fall victim to the Rose Bowl's pressure. Like I know that Jan 1, beautiful sunset and a parade are very important, but college football has gotten way, 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 way bigger in recent years. So we cannot continue to kiss the feet of the Rose Bowl. Like I'm so glad they finally said, all right, we're in. There's nothing we can do about it. We're in. So it does appear now that in 2024 and in 2025, we are bound for expansion. So what does that mean? It means that the week ending in 2024, the week ending Jane, uh, December 21st, home games will feature the higher seeded teams against 
the lower seeded teams. Home games, okay? The quarterfinals will be the Fiesta, Peach, Rose, and Sugar. The semis will be the Cotton and the Orange. And the national championship will be January 20th, 2025 in Atlanta. In 2025, the first round, the date at this point is TBD, but the home field games will take place. Of course, that's the first round. The quarterfinal games will be the Cotton, the Orange, the Rose, and the Sugar. The semifinals will be the Fiesta and the Peach, and the national championship will be January 19th, 2026 in Miami. We'll get to this here a little bit more in the days to come. We're going to have a little bit of time here after next week to kind of break into what this means and what this means for the Rose Bowl, what their ultimate concessions were. But today is not the day to do that. So check back in at a future episode. We're going to break down how the Rose Bowl's involvement has really impacted college football for quite a while. And they've kind of held us hostage, but it does appear as though they're starting to relinquish some of that power. And that's for the betterment of the college football postseason format. So we're excited about that. We'll talk about that here very, very soon. We might be abandoning a couple traditions, but that's probably good because some of these traditions, especially as players continue to quit and, well, excuse me, I didn't use the proper term, opt out because <laughs> players continue to opt out. They aren't necessarily going to play in the Rose Bowl the way they once did. Remember, Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson didn't play in the Rose Bowl last year. Several others probably didn't play as well. I don't recall the names at the top of the list, but that's the Rose Bowl. If they're opting out of the Rose Bowl, what does that mean for the other bowls? So we'll talk about that and its impact here down the road. There's still a place for bowl games, I might add. Still love bowl games. Don't need to go anywhere. We can talk about how to adjust the format in the weeks to come. But there are several other games that we still need to get to, and I want to get to a couple nuggets as it relates to to some of these games. The Conference USA Championship game. This game will be Friday tonight. It'll be tonight at 7.30 Eastern time, okay? UTSA is hosting North Texas. North Texas, since the start of last season, is 9-3 and three against the spread. Seven of the last eight meetings between North Texas and UTSA have gone under the total, and UTSA is 1-4 and four against the spread, as a home favorite this year. Just saying. That's the first little nugget that I'm going to give you, okay, when it relates to the Friday night championship game. So looking forward to that one tonight as UTSA and North Texas get it on there in the Alamo Dome. I like UTSA. Let's go to the MAC championship. Toledo, a slight favorite over Ohio. Both Teams might be without their starting quarterback. Quan Finn for Toledo. Keep an eye on him. If he's available, I like them in the game. If he's not, man, Toledo's been a little bit of a nosedive the last couple weeks. That game will be 12 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow on ESPN. Ohio has covered eight consecutive games. That's the longest active cover streak in the FBS. They are 9-3 and three against the spread this season, tied for the fourth best cover percentage. In the FBS, and if you look at, like I referenced, Toledo, they have failed to cover each of the last five games as a favorite. Like I said, they've been in a bit of tailspin, and they're also 0-3 against the spread against teams with winning records this year. So, Nuggets may be leaning towards the Ohio Bobcats. Like I said, if Daquan Finn goes, give me Toledo. If he doesn't, give me Ohio. Something to watch very, very closely. Let's go to the Sun Belt Championship, Coastal Carolina at Troy, this will be 3.30 Eastern time on ESPN. Troy, what a tremendous season they've had. Just an amazing year for Sumrall and that team. Just an awesome, awesome story. They are 9-3 and three against the spread this season. Like I said, fourth best cover percentage in the FBS. They're tied with, who did I just say? That's what I thought. They're tied with Ohio with the fourth best cover percentage in the FBS. Troy is 4-0 against the spread against teams with winning records this season. However... However, Coastal Carolina 6 and 1 against the spread as an underdog since the start of the 2020 campaign dating all the way back to COVID. The good news is Troy and Coastal the last 5 times they've played, it's gone over. So it's been a high scoring affair. Keep an eye on Coastal Carolina. If Grayson McCall can go, there's real belief that he might be able to go. If he can go, I like Coastal to cover the number, but Troy to ultimately win outright. If he can't go, give me Troy. 
The backup situation for Coastal has not been great. Troy on their home field, I think it's going to be very difficult to upend the Trojans. Let's go next to the American Athletic Championship, the biggest of all the Group of Five Championship games. Maybe not the best, but the biggest. Tulane, a slight favorite over UCF. This game will be 4 o'clock Eastern time on ABC. Tulane is 10-2 and two this year against the spread. They're tied with Oregon State as the best cover percentage in the FBS. They're also 8-2 and two as a favorite. Now, UCF, 12 of their last 15 true road games have gone over the total. So for whatever reason, when UCF leaves the bounce house, points are scored. I don't know why that is, but points are scored. I like Tulane in this game. I know UCF won the game previously, but I just get the sense that Tulane, they didn't get off to a good start in that game. I think they get off to a better start this week. Willie Fritz, the head coach of the Tulane Green Wave, he affirmed his commitment to the organization, even though there was a lot of scuttlebutt about him potentially leaving. I think there's a newfound focus, a re, just kind of a renewed sense of life there for the Green Wave, and I think they get it done against UCF on their home field. I also think that game might be a little bit high scoring. And then finally, the Mountain West Championship game. Fresno State at Boise. Boise, a slight favorite that game's at 4 o'clock Eastern time as well. Five of Boise's last six home games have gone over the total this year. So they have given up some points on the Smurf turf. However, they've been really good against Fresno. They're 15 and 6 against the spread against Fresno, dating all the way back to 2001. It's a long time, though. Think about how good Boise's been since 2001. <laughs> they have won a lot of games. More recently, however, Fresno's been really good as an underdog since the start of the 27, 2017 season. 15-6 and six against the spread since the start of the 2017 season. Five of Fresno's last six games have gone over the total as well. So five of Boise's last six home games have gone over the total. Five of Fresno's last six overall have gone over the total. I This game's going to be really high scoring. I like Jake Hayner to shock the world and to get the outright win on the Smurf turf against a Boise State team that's played really well in the second half of the football season. Give me Fresno State to upset the Broncos and to somehow find a way in what's been an improbable comeback this year after Jake Hayner was hurt and lost for an extended period of time. He's going to finish the season with a flurry. He's one of my favorite quarterbacks in America, and I think he gets the job done by winning the conference championship for the Bulldogs. And take that championship back to the Valley. We so appreciate you being with us. It's been an awesome week of Always College Football. Continue to check in here. We're going to keep you updated as far as the coaching carousel is concerned. There might be more movement here in the next couple of days. I fully expect it to come, especially as some of these conference championship games wrap up. There might be movement with Coastal Carolina. There might be movement as far as some other teams that are playing this weekend as well. So keep an eye and keep it locked in here on Always College Football. For Mark Kubiak and Jack Foster, I'm Greg McElroy. We hope you have an incredible weekend and we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Keep it locked in here on Sunday. We're going to have some reaction to the college football playoff rankings release. Okay, We know that this is selection day coming up here just 48 hours from now. So we hope that you're locked in with us. I'll be in Bristol, but we'll be ready. So keep it locked in here. To always college football. So I hope you have an incredible weekend. Enjoy the games. And remember, it's always college football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.